philosophy at this university. I'm going to take my entire Introduction to Ethics course, which usually takes a whole semester, and condense it down into one video. This is great, actually. This is great. Because, like... I mean, not because, like, I don't have to explain. But I like... I want more um, professors to do stuff like this. I'm going to edit this video fast. Jeremy Bentham looked like this. He was born in London in 1748, and he introduced a moral theory, an ethical theory, called utilitarianism. Utilitarianism mm. says, roughly, we are morally required to do whatever produces the greatest total of pleasure minus pain. Um, okay. A theory like this, any theory like this, is very ambitious. It is purporting to tell you, in any circumstance whatsoever, in any situation, what the morally right thing to do is. And the first specific thing to notice about this theory is that it's a theory about the results of your actions, what your actions produce. Because utilitarianism says that what matters for the moral value, the moral... Yeah, I think utilitarianism is stupid. I think it's stupid, but I can get into that. I have a... I have a theory. I call it... Mm, damn, what do I call it? I could call it dopamine button theory, but I want to call it something a bit more vague because it's not just dopamine. It's dopamine, it's uh, epinephrine, it's oxytocin, it's all these things. Um, what do I call it? Nah, I'll think about it later. Goodness of an action is its consequences or the outcomes that result because of that, utilitarianism is a version of a broader type of moral theory called consequentialism. In a few minutes, and during the normal semester-long version of this course, I would say in a few weeks, we will get to Immanuel Kant's moral theory, which competes with utilitarianism. Kant's theory, as we'll see, is not a form of consequentialism. So hmm. this whole bit about focus... Dude, I've never heard any of these words, by the way. Every... I, got, I think... um. If people see my philosopher's tier list, some of them might think like I took a class on this kind of thing or something like that. But I think anyone who actually did take a class on this stuff would know like, I really don't know any of this stuff. I'm all self-taught. I'm all not like self-taught. You know, I look up stuff on the internet. I've read books, not like read books, but I've, you know, I spent a lot of time in the library with my mom when I was little. Um, we didn't have like that much to do. So it was just me and my mom in the library. She was just chilling talking with people, doing business or whatever. And I would just be in the corner just reading a few pages of each book that I find that looked interesting. And I'd see these kinds of things. So, um, and these are the kinds of books that interested me. But I never actually, like, I'm, consequentialism, I've heard of the word, but I've only heard it like three times in my entire life. Focusing on the consequences becomes very important very soon. But for now, the other thing to notice about utilitarianism is that it focuses on pleasure and pain. Those are the things that, according to this theory, matter, ultimately, for whether an action is morally good or morally bad. In a work called The Rationale of Reward, published in 1825, Bentham says, Prejudice apart, the game of pushpin is of equal value with the arts and sciences of music and poetry. If the game... Mm. Also... There is this whole, I was talking to someone literally today, actually, about religion. And I wasn't talking, they were lecturing me. And they were telling me, like, um, because they're religious, you know, and I'm not like, I would consider myself religious, but I'm not religious in the same way. I don't believe in Islam the way they do. Um, <clears throat> but I was born into it and they were as well and they've known me for a long time, is that kind of situation, right? And they were lecturing me and they're like, you know, I've had doubts and things like that. Um, and a lot of times you understand that like people will push for fear, right? They'll be like, they'll tell stories in religion about how, oh, this person did this thing and then they got, they got sent to hell and they got destroyed by society, they got, you know, punished by God or whatever, right? 
you know, they got wiped out in the flood and all this stuff. And there's so many stories that will push people away from a certain thing, right? And I think, I think what this comes down to is fear versus love. I talked about this in the stream of consciousness, and I'm going to add that to the description as well. Um, add the fear versus love thing to the description. But yeah, basically what this sort of thing comes down to is fear versus love. These are like the two sides to every decision, right? Do you take the fear love or the route love? And it's, it's essentially what's going to win out. Is it your, is it your fear of the punishment or the pain, or is it your love of the, the pleasure or the reward, right? Which will actually, all of your decisions you ever make are a result of one or two, or probably a combination of these, probably both of these things, right? Or not one, one or two, it's, it's probably a result of either one or two of these things. Not probably, it is a result of either. What the hell am I saying? I'm so used to talking like this because everyone is so like, oh, you talk such in such extreme language. So I've gotten in the habit of not doing that. But I thought about it and I'm thinking about it with that in mind. And I'm like, man, you know how religion could really succeed? Or you know how a political side could really succeed? Like if, a, if there is one political side that really wanted to crush the other political side, tell better stories and tell stories that uh, this is morally wrong in my opinion, but tell stories that push people to fear, love versus fear, right? Tell stories that make people fear the other side. Because that's what people do. I mean, you could tell everyone like, hey, love each other. Because, you know, the, the pleasure of love, of loving each other is amazing. And that'll cause some people to come over to your side. But if you tell them, hey, fear the people that are on that side, that'll really cause them to leave their side. And if there's only two sides, they're coming to yours. So, and that's what you see all over the political side of things. The successful campaigns to, to you know, pull people to their side all happen because of fear. It all happens because people are afraid of getting canceled or they're afraid of, you know, whatever it might be. They're afraid of like their audience getting pushed back and all this stuff. So they're like, I'm going to say the politically correct thing and all this stuff. It's always fear that drives their decisions. And to me, a person is more human when love drives their decisions rather than fear. Oh, what the, okay. The push pin furnish more pleasure. It is more valuable than either. Pushpin is a simple child's game. I actually have no idea how it works or what the game is like, but the idea is it's supposed to be a simple game like tic-tac-toe or, or something like that. The point is this. Bentham thinks that it doesn't matter how fancy the pleasure is. Does it come from a simple game like Pushpin? Does it come from something fancy like music or poetry? Doesn't matter. All pleasure counts the same. The only thing that matters to the moral worth of an action is the degree or the amount not the type, but the amount of pleasure that results from it. I think that's kind of, I think that's not very intelligent. I think that's rudimentary. And, um, childish. For you and for everybody else. This is the arithmetic theory of morality. On this theory, everyone's pleasure and everyone's pain counts equally. But maybe there's a problem with this theory. The problem seems to come from the underlying assumption that pleasure and pain are the things that matter. The 20th century... Right, right, there we go. Yeah. Philosopher Robert Nozick attempted to bring out this problem with what's called a thought experiment. Suppose there were an experience machine that would give you any experience you desired. Super duper neuropsychologists could stimulate your brain so that you would think and feel you were writing a great novel or making a friend. This is my thought experiment. What the hell? I was gonna, like the dopamine button, the thing I was talking about. This is, ah, oh, god damn it, somebody else already did it. Fuck, dude, everything I think of, somebody already did. This is the problem with spending so much time on the internet. Like, there's no fun in, in exploring philosophy or whatever if everything is already out there and you just look everything up like, there's no fun in learning these things if you can't learn it yourself, you know? 
I'm glad I thought of it, but it's like, damn, I guess I fucking like, I wasn't going to think of a name for it and then write something up about it. And, you know, I guess I'll just remove it from my notes. Fuck, that's disappointing. Hold up. Give me a second, because I don't want to, you know, keep it in my notes in here and then. Damn it. I would call it like chemical request or something like that, you know? or reading an interesting book. All the time, you would be floating in a tank with electrodes attached to your brain. Should you plug into this machine for life, pre-programming your life's experiences? What does this example show? Well, Nozick thinks that most people would not agree to be plugged into a machine like this for their- mm. Well, most people are on their phones all the time, so yeah, I don't know entire life they wouldn't want to do it and they would be rational to not to want to do it okay i don't know about that there must be something that matters to us something i think it's an it's irrational idea to not want to do that but i think it's reasonable it's good for a human being other than pleasure because of course the experience machine will give you the experience indistinguishable from real life the experience of a very pleasant life. You'll get way more pleasure from being in the experience machine than you would from actually living your own life. You could make an argument this is the direction of humanity, like where it's going. Like you could make an argument this is inevitable. It's going to happen. These machines are slowly making it easier and easier and easier. And eventually a day will come, Neuralink or whatever the hell people have, the metaverse or whatever, uh, eventually, Okay, I'm never saying metaverse again, because meta is already a word, and that dumb fucking company, Facebook, that dumb motherfucker, Mark Zuckerberg, fuck him, took that word and decided to make it so that if you search up meta on Google, his company shows up. Fuck him for that. It was already a word. Pick, pick something else. But it was a very important word, too. But um, what the hell was I saying? Oh, yeah. You could say this is the direction that humanity is going in, and it will eventually just become this. Or you could say that it already is this to a certain degree, because like we're just... No, oh, these are the last pistachios. We're just slaves to the, you know, our brain chemistry, basically. Our brains are simply requesting chemicals and firing pathways based on the chemicals that we receive. Like, there is no free will on a, from a physics perspective, you know? You could say that we already are these sorts of machines. And if it is rational to not opt to be plugged into the experience machine, then it must be that there's a whole bunch of things that are good for people that matter other than just pleasure. Here are some of those things controlling your life. If you're in the experience machine, you'll get plenty of pleasure, but you won't be in control. And maybe... It's important for people. Maybe it's good for people to be in control. We want that and maybe... All these things can be lumped under here. Maybe pleasure is the wrong word. But you could make a better argument for utilitarianism if you use a different word that includes all these things. We're right to want that. Friendship. The experience machine would give you the experience of friendship, but of course there wouldn't be any actual friends. And so maybe actually being friends with people is important. And that's part of the reason why they wouldn't opt into the experience machine. Doing things, you know, actually doing things, as opposed to having the experience as if you were doing them. You know, like, I don't know, building a house or going skydiving or whatever. There's a difference between having the experience as if you had done those things and actually doing them. And maybe we want to do them. Being, I mean, all of these come down to truth. Because having the experiences, if you truly don't know that you're not having experience, if you truly don't know, like I could be living inside, you know, the matrix right now. If you truly have no clue that this is not the true reality, then all of these are exactly the same. Like there's no difference, there's no distinction. Your desire to do these things comes from the fact that one day, the chemical request machine will turn off in the end of the universe or in the explosion of our star or in the sun's expansion and 
you know, whatever, you know, human egg sacs that are around at that time will, uh, you know, it'll set off the alarm bells and go like, uh, temperature too hot, um, removing people from the simulation. We'll be removed from the simulation and we'll be like, holy fuck, we are, have not evolved and we are not equipped to deal with this. And we've been living a lives entire time. And that's really what it is. It's just a lie. The only like difference between these and this is that with these, you're not telling the truth. So then again, there's that hedonic, you know, this comes back to that hedonic um, uh, argument. What matters more to know the truth or to be happy? Is there value in the truth if it results in a reduction in happiness? Kind person or being any type of person. It seems like we want to be a good person. We want to be a good friend. We don't just want to think we're a good person or think we're a good friend or, or whatever. If Nozick is right, then utilitarianism is built on a kind of mistake. The idea that the main things that matter morally to human beings are pleasure and pain. That underlying mistake is typically called hedonism. When Bentham developed utilitarianism in the late 1700s, it led him to some surprising conclusions. There's an essay that wasn't published until after he died called Offenses Against Oneself. As far as we can tell, this essay was the first time anyone ever wrote in the English language that gay sex should not be punished by death. I have been tormenting myself for years to find, if possible, a sufficient ground for treating irregularities of the venereal appetite with the severity with which they are treated at this time of day by all European nations. But upon the principle of utility, I can find none. Huh. When Bentham says principle of utility, he just <laughs> means utilitarianism. The basic idea that what makes an action good or bad is how much pleasure it produces and how little pain it produces. But in this essay, Bentham is just sort of working out the results of this theory on a type of behavior that at his time was universally condemned. It was treated very severely. It just sort of falls out of this theory that consensual homosexual sex amongst adults is not bad. Because as long as it's consensual, it produces pleasure. It's the thing that people want to do. That's why they agree to do it. It just doesn't make sense, Bentham seemed to realize in 1785, for us to hang people that do this thing that doesn't cause pain. That's one specific application of this general moral theory. But there seems to be a problem that was pointed out by H.J. McCloskey for the theory in general. This is a famous example involving a sheriff. The story goes like this. There's a mob of people. Yeah, I don't want to say anything about, about gay, LGBT, or nothing like that, bro. I don't want to get banned. So I don't even want to speak on it. Good or bad, positive or not, I don't care what the hell people might take it as. I don't even want to speak on it. Well, they're angry about some crime that was committed. They think they know who committed the crime, but they're wrong. The sheriff knows who really committed the crime, but the sheriff also knows if he or she doesn't appease the mob, if he or she doesn't frame an innocent person that the mob thinks is guilty, then the mob is going to go wild and hundreds, hundreds of innocent people will die in a riot. According to utilitarianism, what is the sheriff supposed to do? Lie. It's pretty simple. The sheriff is supposed to do the math. This is the arithmetic theory of morality. You just add up all the pleasure and pain, and it seems obvious that the right thing for the sheriff to do according to utilitarianism is to- Utilitarianism ignores evolution. From an evolutionary perspective, you look at it, you look at it from that way. People have Mutations, people have variations, people have differences in their proclivity to, you know, follow the herd, to start riots, to be a part of riots, things like that. People have these differences. So that way, in different, you know, geographies and things like that, the, the people that survive and procreate are the ones who are more suited to that environment, not the highest number of population, right? If all of these people end up dying, then 
they themselves, from a, from a Darwinian perspective, are the ones that are supposed to die. And that one person surviving should survive because he's innocent. There is a, there is a should, like there is a, this person survive, deserves to survive more than this other person simply because people are naturally more or less suited to their environments that they're born in. And that's like a Darwinian perspective. It's not like a human, like, oh, this person deserves to live more than this other person. But the actions you could take, like, okay, I want to make sure that, um, you know, the truth is upheld. These actions where you value them more than you value human life will result in this kind of thing. It'll result in you basically aligning your values with that of nature. Frame the innocent person in order to avoid the riot. But McCloskey thinks that this isn't right. Like, it's just obvious that it's wrong for the sheriff to frame an innocent person. And because, that's because it's obvious to us how the importance of certain factors of evolution. It's obvious to us that it's not best for humanity if the most people survive. It's best for humanity if the highest, the genetically highest merit people survive, which is what they will end up being if people live a truly honest life with themselves, you know? Or it could be the case that, you know, the more honest people or maybe the more dishonest people are the ones that end up surviving, you know, just naturally. Who knows, you know? But just to say that, oh, more people survive, so it's better? No, that's childish. Person. If that's true, then utilitarianism gets the wrong result when it comes to this, this example. And this case turns out to be a counterexample. Aha, okay, utilitarianism is pleasure and pain. If you're looking at it from a grand perspective, utilitarianism is completely wrong because... You guys know the story of the Chinese farmer where it's like, um, where it's like a Chinese farmer has a horse, right? And the, the horse runs off and everyone in the village is like, oh my God, that's terrible. That sucks. That's so bad. Uh, and they're saying all these things. They're saying that's bad. They're saying like, they're, they're saying moral, uh, uh, results of what happened. Like, oh, this is a bad result that happened here. And then uh, the horse, the next day, the horse comes back with two more horses and everyone in the village comes to him and he's like, oh my God, it's amazing. That's so great. I'm so happy for you. That's so good. It's so good that this happened. Very fortunate, right? You're so lucky. And then the next day, the farmer's son was riding on one of the new horses and the horse knocks him off and he breaks his arm. And all the people come to the uh, farm and they're like, oh my God, that's so bad. We're so sorry for you. That's such a terrible thing that happened to you. And then the next day, uh, a military person uh, comes, a military general, a military leader comes, and they said, we need all able-bodied men to join the military. And uh, because the guy had, a, the kid had, the broken, had a broken arm, he didn't have to go, he didn't get drafted. And everyone's like, oh my God, it's so great, that's so amazing. And it just keeps on going, and going, and going, and going, and going. There's good, bad, and good, then bad, and good, then bad, and good, then bad. And ultimately, there's no end. There's literally no end. The end will be the same no matter what. The end will be the universal heat death. No matter what. That will be the end. Um, and so, like, if you look at it like that, you could say, even from a utilitarian perspective, it's better to let the riot happen and let hundreds of people die and keep that one person alive because he's innocent. Because in the grand scheme of things, more people will result from that person's genetics and things like that. And there will be more, uh, <laughs> like if you let these people live, right? You let all these people live. You're not solving the problem. And that's that they themselves are living in a natural world and in, in a sane world, but being insane regardless, you know, they're not uh, able to see the truth in, in the, the nature of the world, in its truest form, if that person truly is innocent. And so because of that, you might delay all the pain that's going to happen to hundreds of people that are going to die right now. 
But guess what? Eventually, that's going to catch up to you. And if those people propagate their genes, thousands of people are going to die in the future. And eventually, everyone will die. Eventually, none of these moral things actually even matter. So utilitarianism, even by its own standard, when you look at it from a grand enough perspective, when you look at it through a long enough time period, everything good and bad just turns out to be kind of neutral. It turns out to be kind of just how things end up being, you know? A counterexample is one type of objection to a philosophical theory, and I have another video where I explain what counterexamples are and how they work, and I'll link to it somewhere, or maybe you've already seen it, or I don't know. Okay, so this course starts off with some stuff about utilitarianism. Then we go on to Kant's theory, that's in like 30 seconds. Then it's Aristotle, Nietzsche, and then we come to the question of like, is there even such a thing as objective moral facts or objective moral law? Are there really moral rules that exist independent of what we happen to think about them, our moral feelings or our moral opinions? Are there real, true moral facts that govern our behavior? That's the third and final unit of this course, which in the semester comes in the you know last few weeks of the semester, but in this case comes in like four minutes from now. But before that, let's talk about what is almost definitely the most famous paper in applied ethics that has ever been written it's by okay peter yeah singer. i just subbed to the guy singer and it was published in 1972 peter singer looks like this i once got to have dinner with him after an academic talk the paper is called famine affluence and morality and in this paper singer makes a very radical claim everyone that you've ever met is a morally bad person the circumstance that we find our ooh that's interesting selves in today in our relatively wealthy societies is such that we must, we're morally obliged to give the money that we would otherwise spend on luxuries like clothes that we don't really need or food from a restaurant that we don't really need because we... And you know what? There is a certain extent that I agree with this. There is a certain extent that I talk about bad labor, okay? That there is... Forget the fact that like things might cost a lot or cost very little or whatever. There is... This idea that like the labor that you are paying for people to do, the labor that you are eliciting out of people results in very little prosperity for the general person when that same person can be putting their time and effort into something much better, you know, something that helps a lot more people. And it's not up to that person. It's up to you as someone paying them because you're paying them to do their job. So... To me, I look at the people who are like, who buy like Louis Vuitton, who keep Louis Vuitton in business or keep Gucci in business or keep Supreme or Prada or, you know, Hermes or all these other companies. They keep them in business. They keep them, the companies functioning. I look at these people like idiots. I'm like, you're paying for bad labor. You're paying for people to waste their lives. Could cook the food at home. We need to spend that extra luxury money giving it away to people who need that money. No, no, I don't agree. I don't think you need to give it away. I think pay for good labor. That's what you need to do. I think for me personally, it's very, very valuable to spend money. You got extra money. Don't spend it on, you got 20 shirts, right? It has more than enough. 20 shirts is more than enough. Don't buy, don't buy a closet full of like 50 t-shirts or whatever, okay? Don't do that. Um, maybe for some people, they see a lot more value in it. Maybe buy like 30 t-shirts or whatever. But don't go so overboard, especially when it's literally just marketing campaigns convincing you that these are the things that actually matter in life or th these things will bring you happiness. No, I'm of the opinion that there's things that will, that when you buy them, those companies deserve because the labor that they, they have, that labor results in more prosperity for people. Even things like car companies. Like, bro, don't, if you got an extra, you know, few thousand dollars spent on luxuries, don't buy other, like, bullshit, like the brand new iPhone or whatever. Nah, spend it on, um, you know, a, a, instead of buying a Toyota Camry, buy a Lexus ES, you know? Spend it on better labor for better car companies so that way they have more money to make cars for cheaper for other people, better kinds of cars, better technologies, because cars themselves and, and that kind of transportation technology in general 
results in more prosperity, not only for themselves, but for the company, but for everyone. And if that company does well, then everybody else does well as well. So, yeah, if, if Louis Vuitton makes a lot of money, who does that help? Who, who, who gets to benefit? Louis Vuitton, nobody else. Literally nobody else. Not even the person who buys their clothes. If you buy a Louis Vuitton scarf, you don't get anything out of that. But, you know, if you, if you buy a nice car, that's good labor. You're getting something nicer. I'm not saying buy a fucking Ferrari. Because that's bad labor. Because Ferraris are overpriced. Because their margins are really bad. Uh, they're really high. Because, you know, they make their cars for $40,000 and they sell it for $200,000. I'm saying buy a car... You want to buy an expensive car? Buy one that costs forty thousand dollars to make, but they're selling it for fifty-five thousand dollars. Buy a uh, you know a, a Porsche Boxster or you know a, a buy a Miata. Buy a Miata. That's a great car. Those are very cheap to make as well. But you know, buy a Lexus. Buy don't buy you know these German bullshit fucking Mercedes BMW. These cars. Buy something even more luxurious, even more smooth. Buy a fucking you know, Equus, a Hyundai Equus or something like that, you know? Cars that people don't appreciate all that much, people don't even talk about, but like, they're good labor. You don't even have to give your money away, but buy good things. In order to survive. He's talking about giving money to organizations like Oxfam or UNICEF. These are organizations that very efficiently take your money and transport it across the world and use it to literally save people's lives. People who very well might die of famine. Famine, there's not enough food. They would die of famine within the next few days or weeks, but instead they get to live. Singer writes, because giving money is regarded as an act of charity, it is not thought that there is anything wrong with not giving. The charitable man may be praised, but the man who is not charitable is not condemned. People do not feel in any way ashamed or guilty about spending money on new clothes or a new car instead of giving it to famine relief. Indeed, the all- No, no, no. I, I think there's a balance in between. I think buy good clothes. I think buy a bunch of white tees that'll last you a long time. I think um, buy clothes that have lower profit margins. Uh, buy clothes that are comfortable, that have utility, uh, buy clothes with bigger pockets, with more pockets so that you get more utility out of them, with function, um, and that'll last and, uh, you know, are made of materials like wool or other materials like that, that, uh, you know, maybe they have properties that make them less likely to catch on fire. Maybe they have more insulating properties. Maybe they have properties to, uh, make them more hydrophobic. Or maybe they are made out of those certain materials that um, that bugs don't like to be around because they, they don't like the smell of and things like that, you know? Um, these are things that are all like good like forms of labor, I think. They're, they have utility to them. They have function to them. Um, these are the clothes that I would be like, yeah, sure, go for it, buy it. But if someone buys a fucking like supreme brick for like hundreds of dollars i'd be like yeah you're a fucking idiot just find a brick off facebook marketplace they're free but um it's not like buying anything past your needs is is i mean i guess the argument he's making is wrong i guess the argument he's making is that it's wrong but it's not that i'm making any arguments i'm saying there is a balance here and i think it's a real nice balance there's a such thing as good labor and bad labor and instead of donating to charity you don't have to donate to charity you shouldn't feel ashamed so long as you're only spending money on good labor. And you can very clearly tell by people's marketing strategies who has good labor and who doesn't, right? When some fucking like J station is like, we're fucking using Ouija boards at 3 a.m. or whatever, don't listen to what he says. Don't give him any, his labor should not be rewarded. His labor should not have your attention. You should not give him watch time, thus giving him more attention and more money. And he's banned from YouTube now, so it doesn't really matter. But other YouTubers like that. Fucking, who's the newest one that's like Brett Rivera and all them? Don't give them any attention. Don't watch their videos. You're, you're giving them money for bad labor. Demand more from people. Demand they provide higher entertainment value, you know? Alternative does not occur to them. This way of looking at the matter cannot be justified. He thinks that it's not okay to buy coffee. 
at a coffee shop. Because buying coffee at a coffee shop is a luxury. You could make that coffee at home. He thinks that that extra money. This guy, when he edits videos, he should have like a little keyboard shortcut or something to just mono his audio. Because look, for cinematic videos and all this stuff, cool, go for it. But um, the camera he's recording it on is not all that, uh, how would you say it? intelligent in in you know like he's clearly talking from just make them both the same or just make it mono you know it's much easier smaller file size is literally half the file size for the audio and there's very quick keyboard shortcuts that you can do on premiere pro and things like that to make it mono money must be given to famine relief because these famines are going on and if you don't give to famine relief but then again look dude you never actually save anyone there's no such thing as saving people's lives. You're only delaying their deaths. Everyone will die, so. You're doing something evil every day. All you're doing is giving them luxuries instead of yourself. And in my opinion, you could say it's somewhat evil, but it's not, there is no like a, not everything that's equal, that everything that's evil is equally evil, you know? If something is only, you know, T a tiny bit evil. It's not that big of a deal. That's literally what it means to be a tiny bit evil. But um, I think it's, I don't think it's evil. I wouldn't say it's evil, but I think it's stupid. I think it's stupid to spend money on bad labor. Okay, that's like a kind of radical moral claim. What is his argument for that? Part of his argument comes from a famous shallow pond example. If I am walking past a shallow pond and see a child drowning in it, I ought to wade in and pull the child out. This will mean getting my clothes muddy, but this is insignificant, while the death of the child would presumably be a very bad thing. If someone came to your house and said, Right, and this argument actually comes down to um, this whole like, uh, I talk about this a lot in some of my SOCs about proximity and about Dunbar's number and about how like, you can't save everyone. You can't look at the rest of the world and be like, these, these entities on the internet are telling me that the, their injustice is happening and I should lend my support. You can't, it's not a feasible way to look at that and be like, my threshold for helping people will be if I see any suffering happening in the 8 billion people alive today. No, you should actually um, value Proximity because it's gonna happen no matter what if you don't spend any time with your family and because they live in a totally different state You never even know who they are. You don't grow up with them. You don't play the same games as them. They're not family anymore You form a new family like that's as much as people might not like to think about that. That's how it works proximity matters Hey, on my so the very difference in the in the thing that he was describing is like uh, oh, yeah, this person drowning in this pond versus this person starving in Africa. Uh, they're basically the same thing. And I'm like, no, they're not the same thing. Because the difference between the two, that very difference that you described to make that analogy, right? The proximity between the two, between you and that person, is exactly the difference to make that moral decision. Because it will happen no matter what. Um, and, and people close to you in proximity will matter more to you. And that's okay because you only have so much empathy to go around you can't give it to everyone dunbar's number exists for a reason you can't have unlimited friends you, you spread your empathy too thin you won't have any empathy at all for the people close to you in fact you won't have any empathy at all for anyone you won't have any empathy to save anyone at all um you just have enough empathy to like look people's directions if you spread it thin enough you know which is possible we don't have unlimited we have a limited pool of empathy so pick and choose your battles. Not every fight is your fight. And you know what? I'll leave that one, that link in the description as well. Not every fight is your fight. There was another thing I was talking about in the other stream, stream of consciousness. That, um, you know what? I'll leave this one in here too. Um, 3,000 miles away. Talking about proximity. I'll leave all those in the description. Way here, I saw this little child drowning to... Actually, let me let me add names to these clips. Um, uh, proximity. Just so you guys know, when you go to the description, what you're looking for. Uh, 
to death in a shallow pond. I could have stepped into the pond and saved the child's life, but it would have cost me something. I would have gotten my pants wet, and so I just let the child die. If someone said that to you, you would think that they're evil, and you would ask them to leave your home immediately. Saving the child in the shallow pond is not some extra nice thing. No, 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 no. Saving the child in the shallow pond is the bare minimum, morally speaking. Singer thinks that your situation, in which you can give to famine relief, is morally identical with the situation- No, it's not morally identical. In which a person walks past a shallow pond in which a child is drowning. Well, there must be some differences. Well, Singer considers some potential differences between- It's the very difference he makes in the analogy is the difference. Circumstance that you find yourself in, and this circumstance. One is proximity. The person who walks past- Yo, no way! I wasn't even watching the video. I was looking for the thing to put in link in the description. There's no way he actually... Dude, I swear to God, I did not watch the video or anything like that. I never actually, like, read up on any philosophy. That's crazy. I had these thoughts originally on my own. But, um, of course, somebody thought of it before me. The shallow pond is very physically close to this child drowning. Damn, that, that audio effect, bro. Listen, to, if you got headphones, listen to the panning from right to left. The person who walks past the shallow pond is very physically close to this child drowning. That was pretty cool, bro. That was pretty, that was some fucking, like, trap, like, you know, fucking Chicago-style, like, producer tag effect. Whereas you are physically distant from people who are dying of famine on the other side of the planet. But is proximity morally relevant? Well, one way that proximity can be morally relevant is that sometimes proximity indicates whether you have the power to help or not. If you are mere feet away from the pond, then you can help because you're close by. And normally you can't save a person on the other side of the planet because you can't get there in time. But Singer points out that because of the existence of these relief agencies, you can help them. So because of their existence, proximity is not a, is not a morally relevant difference between these two cases. Another potential difference is that there's other people. In the case of famine relief, there are other people who could help, and they're not helping. Does that make a moral difference? Singer thinks that it doesn't. Mm. You know what? I don't think it does either. I think it doesn't as well. You could modify the shallow pond example by supposing that there's a whole bunch of other people who can see this child drowning. Suppose that they're not helping. The fact- Actually, no, it might make a difference. It might make a difference because if everyone is doing something, there might be a reason for it that they don't help doesn't seem to mean that you don't have to either. If someone showed up at your house and said, I passed by this child, I didn't want to help him, but there were all these other people, they didn't help either. So I'm good, right? No, you're not good. You're a monster. Get out of my house. The fact that there's other people who could help, but who don't, just doesn't seem relevant. But the main thing to take away about this paper is that the conclusion is radical. Everyone who reads it thinks, there's gotta be something wrong with this argument, but no one can figure out what the problem is. Okay, next up is Kant. Huh. No one can figure out what the problem is? I feel like if I think about it for long enough, I could figure out what the problem is. Aristotle, Friedrich Nietzsche, Plato, and then the question of whether there are any objective moral facts at all. Here we go. Immanuel Kant was a philosopher who lived his entire life in the town of Königsberg from 1724 to 1804. His moral theory is often called deontology. You don't have to know what that word means. You can just think of it as Kant's theory. The theory is very complicated, so usually I have my students read a summary of part of Kant's moral theory or ethical theory by a philosopher, a very well-known, still living philosopher named Onora O'Neill. And so this is my summary of O'Neill's summary of Kant. Kant's theory is built around the idea of a maxim. A maxim is a kind of intention when you intend to act, except for with certain specific details removed. So for example, if I intend to promise you that I'm gonna go to your- Wait, 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 wait. Okay, so I was looking for a thing. I gotta rename it something else, but um, I think I found the video, but I wanna go back here, I wanna rewatch this. O'Neill, and so I have to think of it as Kant, the town of Königsberg from 1724 to 1804. His moral theory is often called deontology. You don't have to know what that word means. You can just think of it as Kant's theory. The theory is very complicated, so usually I have- Give me one sec, I've gotta check this to add to the description. I, I can't lose this, bro. Hold up.
Okay, okay. Okay, I'm back, I'm back. ...still living philosopher named Onora O'Neill, and so this is my summary of O'Neill's summary of Kant. Kant's theory is built around the idea of a maxim. A maxim is a kind of intention when you intend to act, except for with certain specific details removed. So, for example, if I intend to promise you that I'm going to go to your recital or whatever, well, that's my intention. The maxim that I'm operating under might be something like promise to do something in the future. Promise to do something in the future is less specific than promise to go to your recital. Kant's theory goes like this. When determining whether an action is right or wrong, you figure out what the maxim is that that action is based on. We already know that this theory is dramatically different from utilitarianism. I like this one. Utilitarianism was about the results or the consequences of an action. Yeah, I really like this. Kant's theory focuses entirely, or almost entirely, on the maxim, the intentions, what you have in mind when you act. These are two totally different things. However, mm, I see problems. The results of your action and your intention or your, your thoughts, your purposes. Okay, so for Kant, it's the intentions or the maxim that matters. You look at the maxim that the action is based on and you ask the following question. Is this maxim something that everyone involved in the action could potentially agree to? If the answer is yes, then that action is morally permissible. If the answer is no, then that action is morally impermissible. Not allowed, bad, evil, no good. O'Neill writes, for example, one person- Oh God, that's, re that's a really slippery slope. That's a really slippery slope, but you know what? That's how it goes. That's literally how it goes. Oh shit. But that's a really, oh God. Like if everyone just decides, hey, this innocent person just fucking kill him. And they just do it. But you know, if everyone, no, 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 never mind, never mind. Because if everyone were to agree, then that means I would also agree. So yeah, never mind, never mind. Solid. Actually, it's impractical. Because people would have, people doubt their own morality, first of all, intelligent people at least. And there's also the whole idea of like, dude, you find enough people, you get a group of 10,000 people, someone will say hi, and somebody will be pissed off at that person who says hi for saying hi. Like, you get enough people, somebody will, will be like, yeah, that's not okay. They make a promise to another with every intention of breaking it. If the promise is accepted... And I don't want to live in that kind of world if this is the moral prerogative, if this is the rules that we play by, that so long as there is at least one person that considers this thing morally impermissible, then it is morally impermissible, then bro, that's not just the majority of things being morally impermissible, because that's not a world I want to live in, where the majority of things you'd end up doing would be, you know, viewed by society as wrong. Bro, in that society, everything is morally impermissible. Everything. And that's why, you know, fucking Mr. Beast curing blindness will literally cause controversy on Twitter. Then the person to whom it was given must be ignorant of what the promiser's intention or maxim really is. And since the person who is deceived doesn't know that real maxim, he or she can't, in principle, consent to his or her part in the proposed scheme of action. Notice that Kant's theory gets a very different result on that sheriff example than utilitarianism did. Think of the maxim that the sheriff would be acting on were he or she to frame an innocent person. The maxim would be something like, try to avoid some terrible thing by doing some other terrible thing, framing someone who didn't commit a crime. Well, there's someone involved who could never, would never consent, would never agree to this way of acting, and that's the person who would be framed. And so unlike utilitarianism, Kant's moral theory says that the sheriff should not frame the innocent person in order to prevent the riot. Hmm. So at this point, we're like six- I don't know about that one either, but- Weeks into the semester, and we've been talking about the question of which actions are morally good and which actions are morally bad. Oh Even God, what? Do, like, is this thing moral? Is this thing not moral? Is it immoral? Bro, are morals moral? That's the real question. Is it moral to be moral?
even if we can answer that question, even if we can agree on which actions are morally good and which actions are morally bad. That's like some inside out shit. Like, damn, do your feelings have feelings? There's the question of why do those actions? That is, why be moral? Here are two very famous philosophers who have answers to this sort of question. Aristotle's answer, as we will see in about 20 seconds, is because it will make you happy. Nietzsche's answer, which we will see in maybe 40 or 50 seconds, is don't. Why be moral? Don't. Morality is for losers. <laughs> hey, that's some giga chat shit, bro. And that's why Aristotle's above Nietzsche on the tier list. Aristotle thought that all things... Where'd I put Nietzsche in? B tier? I either put him in B or C. I think I'd put him in B. I would put him in B. But then again, there's some, there was, I remember putting some like real strong t flaws for some beats here. Like, oh uh, no, I think I'd put him in C actually. Cause, shit, yeah, no, if I'm putting like Dostoevsky in B tier, cause he can't go in A. A tier is for the gods. Um, yeah, C tier. I wonder where I did put him though. Maybe at the bottom of B tier. Things that exist have a nature or an essence. Not just people, but rocks and mountains and animals. Everyone has a purpose that they are striving towards. Yeah, entropy. My man was doing psychedelics, bro. And the degree to which you achieve this purpose or this goal that is built into you in nature is the degree to which you are fulfilled. And Aristotle's word... Um... Uh... I don't think, okay, yeah, maybe, yeah, 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 yeah. But not as individuals, as a species, yes. As a species, we operate as a singular organism. And if we, you know, over hundreds of thousands, millions of years evolve to be able to extract all of the energy out of all of the, you know, potential energy in all the particles around us, then, yeah, okay, that will result in meaning for the collective species because that's really what it is that's that's what's happening it's all the arguments that people have are just a battle for what the best way is to you know drain the world of all of its energy it's not it's not about not draining the world of energy it's about what the best way to do it the most efficient way to get all of it do we wait for our species to become advanced enough to to you know do we take it slow or do we just drain it quick, go fast or whatever, you know? And the, the, the slow one is the conservative one and the fast one is the liberal one. And so these are like the two sort of mind states you can have, the two sort of speeds you can have in terms of your desire for the species to progress and to evolve the meta, essentially. Um, but, huh. Yeah, as a species, yeah, sure. But as individuals, no. As individuals, look, if all you're doing is going around committing arson everywhere, I think for most people that won't be as fulfilling as, like, you know, having a family. For this is eudaimonia. But they end up resulting in the same thing regardless. Eudaimonia. I thought it was eudaimonia. At the beginning of his famous work of moral philosophy... Never mind, it's spelled differently. ...Nicomachean Ethics, which was named for his son, Nico. Aristotle discusses what eudaimonia, what happiness or flourishing or success for a creature, for a human being, what that is. Is it pleasure? Is that the goal of a human being? No, he just sort of says that this is suitable for beasts. Is it honor? Is that the thing that allows a human being to flourish? No, Aristotle says, because honor depends too much on other people. Whatever it is that is the good for a human being, is something that other people can't just decide to take away from you whenever they want to take it away, but that's exactly what they can do with honor. Is it wealth? A lot of people pursue wealth as if that's the thing that is fulfillment. That's interesting. All of these things have value. In terms of pushing for entropy, if you look at that from that perspective, in terms of pushing for entropy, all of these things have value. For a human being, no. And so does starting family. It's not wealth because wealth is only something that you want because it leads to something else. The only purpose of money is to spend that money, either today or tomorrow or years from now. Having money isn't good. Money is only good for other things. And so whatever the good for a human being is, it's not, you know, something that's just 
wanted for something else. So wealth is out. Okay, final option. Is it the possession of virtue? It's the chemicals. Having a good character, possessing virtue, is that what it is for a human being to flourish? Aristotle says- And you know what? Possession of virtue, depending on how you define virtue, is really the ultimate decider of whether or not you get to procreate. That's really what it is. Throughout history, the definition of virtue changes, but possessing virtue will result in your ability to continue your life and stay immortal, for your genes to stay immortal, basically, you know? So, you know, I'd rather be uh, immortal and immoral than mortal and moral. Actually, no. No, it's not. Because merely having virtues, like being a courageous person or being a good person or whatever, merely having these virtues is compatible with being asleep your whole life. You could be asleep your whole life and have these characteristics, but you never get to act on them. That wouldn't be a good life. That wouldn't be successful. That wouldn't be an example of a human. And therefore, it's your result on the world. It's entropy. It's how much entropy you're able to achieve or how much potential entropy you're able to um, allow the species to achieve and to, to take hold of, you know, for the expanse of the rest of the universe. Being flourishing. Okay, Aristotle, fine. Then just tell us, what is the good for a human being? To figure out the answer, Aristotle thinks he has to figure out what the function or purpose of a human being is. Today, we oh, think shit. of people as having a function or a purpose in the same way that Aristotle did. But, okay, he thinks that if he can figure out what the function or purpose of a human being is, then that will tell him what will satisfy a human, what will allow them to succeed in their life. Okay. The first option he considers is nutrition and growth. Is that Entropy. There you go, bro. It's all the same thing. This is what it's leading to. That's the function or purpose of a human being? No. Because that's not unique to human beings. That's also something that plants do. Yeah, yeah. We all have the same purpose. It's the universe. We are the universe. We are all the... Just because this other thing also does it doesn't mean it's not... Huh. That's That was a dismissal of it? There's no way. Good thing I didn't put him in S tier. He doesn't belong there. What about perception? Is the purpose or function of a human being to know the world around it, to perceive it? Maybe Wait, I have a thing that I want to put in the description. Um, playlists. Is that the function in their life? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Um, let me mute this here. Okay, cool. I could just keep playing it. The first option he considers is nutrition and growth. Is that the function or purpose of a human being? No, because that's not unique to human beings. That's also something that plants do. What about perception? Is the purpose or function of a human being to know the world around it, to perceive it, maybe even move within it? No, that's also not unique to human beings. That doesn't need to be unique to human beings. Because animals do that. The purpose or we are not different from you from animals function of a human being has to be something that involves this thing that is distinctive of humans Aristotle thinks and that is rationality okay well what is the activity that centrally involves rationality Aristotle thinks that it is exercising the virtues by exercising he means actually doing it actually living a courageous life actually doing good things. Th and you know what? Uh, I don't know if you ever like seen the way animals act around humans, like in these videos where like, uh, uh, what's it called? Deer will like see uh, their like, a mother deer will see their like baby um, stuck inside a fence or something like that. And like human beings will try to get it out. And naturally deer are terrified of human beings. It's, their in, it's in their programming but they will act courageously. They will act upon the virtue of courage to try to get their the human away from their baby. And they'll stand their ground. Like they'll stand their ground like, like as if, if you were to see that, you wouldn't even believe they were afraid of humans. You know, you wouldn't even believe that they were actually prey and not predators. Um, and I've experienced this in my own life. We had a bird's nest out here. And you know what, I'll tell that story one day. I want to tell that story. It's a real satisfying, it's not that satisfying a story, but because it happened to me, it feels so, it hits so much harder than it does all these other stories about these animals 
breaking free from their programming to do something courageous or do something virtuous or, you know, help other animals or things like that. Um, acting on the, the human, human virtues, human values, because we're not much different from animals. We all value the same sorts of things. These values emerge because of our evolution, because they result in, in uh, like higher probability of survival. Um, but the story of this bird, holy shit, it was the scariest thing ever from a bird that I never thought could ever be scary in my life. Uh, it was a mother bird protecting her baby bird. And it's a story that I'll tell. And it was the cutest thing ever. It's a story that I'll tell one of these days, um, but in, in the right setting. I know I just said all that. Trust me, I don't have fucking dementia. Maybe I do. It's not early onset dementia, but um, not just yet. I'm 23. So, you know, maybe one day, but not today. Thinks that if you do that, trying to beat, trying to beat the dementia allegations, then you will be fulfilled. Well, let's just flip this around. Why be moral or why be virtuous is another way to put it. Why be virtuous? Well, because it will make you happy or as Aristotle would put it, fulfilled, flourishing, successful. <sighs> you know what? This was too hard. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can summarize my whole ethics course in one video. I haven't even gotten through Nietzsche. We're like halfway through the semester and I'm exhausted. So I think I'm gonna have to make this video two parts. This will be the first part. And the next part, we'll start up with Nietzsche. We'll get his answer to why be moral, which is don't be moral, morality's for losers. We'll start with that. And then we will go on to the question, which will occupy us for several minutes and during the normal semester, several weeks, of whether there are objective moral facts that apply to everyone everywhere. And to do that, we're gonna have to talk about Plato and John Locke and David Hume and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, David Hume, the fucking like most, you know, fucking ugliest, like worst, the, the most guttural reaction philosopher ever, bro. The most like disgusting philosopher ever. Um, but yeah. Part two. Should I watch it? You know what? Maybe later. Maybe later.